from the spike of the Second World War, there's been a historically unusual period of peace among uh, developed countries. We take it for granted now that wars are things that happen in poor, nasty parts of the world. But it wasn't always like that. It was always it used to be the rich countries that fought each other. Hi, I'm Ron Bailey for Reason TV, and I'm joined today by cognitive neuroscientist Steven Pinker from Harvard University, talking about his new book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. First, why has violence declined? I think most people will be astonished to hear that. Yes, first of all, I have to convince people that there's a fact that needs to be explained, namely that violence has declined, and it has. Uh, I demonstrate with uh, 100 graphs and, and uh, data sets before turning to the reasons, which I think are, are, uh, are multiple. Uh, one of them is the uh, spread of government, the outsourcing of revenge to a more or less disinterested third party. That tends to ramp down your rates of vendetta and blood feud for all the reasons that we're familiar with from The Sopranos and The Godfather. Namely, if it's always you who's the judge, jury, and executioner, you're always going to think you're right. You're always going to think the other guy is a nefarious, uh, treacherous scoundrel who, who deserves only punishment. When you have two sides both thinking that, then you can have uh, cycles of violence. If you've got a disinterested third party, they're more likely to uh, nip the cycle in the bud. The second one is the growth of, uh, of commerce, opportunities for positive sum exchange as opposed to zero sum plunder. When it's cheaper to buy something than to steal it, that changes the incentives and you get each side valuing the uh, other more alive than dead. It's the theory of gentle commerce from, uh, from the Enlightenment. So how much has violence gone down? How, how would you characterize it briefly to, to people? From the transition from tribal societies to settled states, there was a, a reduction from about a 15% chance of uh, dying violently down to about a 3% chance in the first uh, states. Now, when would this have been? What period do you have in mind there? It that began about 5,000 years ago in some parts of the world, and it's proceeded unevenly throughout the rest of the world. So why is it, though, that people tend to, be tend to believe that violence is increasing? Why, why do we have that perception? I, I have been at a conference, for example, where I outlined your thesis briefly to a, a panel of fairly distinguished political scientists and economists, and they rejected it out of hand. They said, but the 20th century, Ron, the 20th century was horrible. Millions died. Yeah, well, millions died in centuries before the 20th. So people confuse a data point with a trend. They uh, remember the uh, horrific episodes of violence in the 20th century. But, uh, but, but uh, one occurrence is not a trend. And despite universal predictions that World War I to World War II was just the beginning of a sequence, where World War III would be even worse, World War III didn't happen. And in fact, from the spike of the Second World War, there's been a historically unusual period of peace among uh, developed countries. We take it for granted now that wars are things that happen in poor, nasty parts of the world. But it wasn't always like that. It was always, it used to be the rich countries that fought each other. And the great powers, the, the 800 pound gorillas at any given period in history, were constantly in each other's face. Since the, uh, since the end of the Korean War, there hasn't been a great power war. It's not an enormous stretch of history, but it's not an insignificant slice uh, either. Now, you said that that was the longest period of peace in 500 years, though, really. That's right. Uh, certainly the longest period of great power uh, peace, uh, probably since the, the Roman Empire. Also, we, the news media uh, follow the policy, if it bleeds, it leads. If uh, millions of people die of Alzheimer's and heart attacks and cancer, there isn't a news crew filming those deaths. But if a dozen people get blown, blown to bits by a terrorist bomb, you can be sure we'll be reading about it. And so given that the human mind estimates risk by how easily it can recall examples, that's a basic discovery of cognitive psychology, uh, and there are always enough incidents of violence in absolute terms to fill the news, our perception of violence is going to be disconnected from the proportions. Some people are going to go, oh, you know, Steven Pinker is over-interpreting this random period, this fluctuation, just happened to be a peaceful period, and something terrible is going to happen. How could you say that perhaps you aren't over-interpreting? Yeah, I don't think, something terrible could happen. There's a, there is a big dose of randomness in human history. And uh, some cunning fanatic somewhere might be 
promoting a new movement that will gain adherence and lead to brutal insurgencies and, and, and repression. Maybe some hothead will get control of China and decide, well, it's finally time to rectify the historic injustice of Taiwan once and for all, and who knows what would happen if they decided to act on it. Stuff happens. What doesn't happen, though, is uh, what uh, is uh, cycles of buildup and release. Namely, well, uh, every year that has passed without a war means we're more and more due for the next one. Like, tensions have been building up. It's only a matter of time before they'll burst. That doesn't happen. And, and that's the mental model that a lot of people have, of some kind of cycles uh, or periodicity in history. And I think there's no evidence for that, though there is evidence for the occasional very unpleasant surprise. Why did this arise now? Why are we experiencing that? Yeah, right why is it the last 50 or 60 years? I, yeah. I suspect that it is, again, the uh, spread of uh, information. That uh, it may not be a coincidence that it's the McLuhan start of the cliche that we live in a global, global village, thanks to electronic media. We sense other people's um, ways of life much more immediately. They feel much more like part of the, the family, even if we are not like them. But also, the, a, a revival of the Enlightenment acceleration of argument, debate, knowledge, uh, rational examination of how we live our lives. I guess reason to put in a little plug for our, our sponsor. <laughs> because uh, it's amazing how quickly a lot of these customs crumbled once they were just put under the microscope. When you really come down to it, should homosexuality be, be illegal? You're going to lose that argument. <laughs> uh, you, you, could, you could grasp at straws, well, the Bible says so, well, our ancestors did it that way. But it, they aren't very good arguments. It reminds me of something that Tim Ferriss said, that there is the scientific method, and that liberalism is also a method. It is not an ideology. It is a way of approaching the world and trying to find out what works. Absolutely. And that was, that's one of the toxic features of the deadly ideologies of the 20th century. Perhaps the, the best example is Mao's Great Leap Forward, uh, where I mean, it was a screwball idea for all kinds of reasons. But one of them was, as people were dying by the millions, he didn't change his mind. Uh, it was, stay the course, full speed ahead, I don't care about reality, I've had this, this, this brainchild, and I'm going to impose it on uh, this country, come what may. And it, it, it's a, a sobering lesson for all forms of political belief systems, including libertarianism, that is, You've got to be receptive to signals from the world telling you whether your ideas really are making people better off or not. Do you think this beneficial trend, this trend toward less violence, is likely to continue for the 21st century? I think some forms are likely to continue. I think the campaign to target certain categories of violence and to bring shaming campaigns uh, against them worldwide are likely to succeed, as they succeeded in the past for forms of institutionalized violence like slavery and piracy and, and uh, whaling. Uh, so for example, I think violence against women is likely to go down because there's pressure both from the bottom up and the top down. Uh, I think that prob uh, probably capital punishment will continue to decline. That's certainly been the, the, uh, the trend. Uh, I think the beating of children will continue to decline. Cases where there's a society-wide practice and social norms um, determine the, the current level. There are other kinds of violence that are much more sporadic, chaotic, unpredictable. There it's much harder to, to predict. So for example, uh, civil wars and uh, where you don't have a responsible uh, pair of governments making the conscious decision to go to war, something that's kind of falling out of fashion, but you can always get some nasty little militia or insurgency doing a bunch of damage. Right. Um, uh, crime rates have defied every expert prediction, and it would, I think it would be foolish to say they couldn't go up again, given that they go up when people expect them to go down and vice versa. Thank you very much, Steve, for coming in and talking to us about your fabulous new book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, Why Violence Has Declined. For Reason TV, I'm Ron Bailey.